So welcome everyone on this currently rainy afternoon. It was sunny a minute ago. Um, just a reminder to silence your phones and other devices and we can get going. So I'm Liza Bernard. I'm the programming librarian here at Norman Williams, which is something that's a wonderful position to have in this wonderful 140 year old building and this beautiful space for events. We're very excited to host this panel of creative podcasters this afternoon. They're all members of a um, group called Hub and Spoke, which is a nonprofit collective. Can you all hear me? Okay. It's a nonprofit collective of independent audio essayists. And they are, uh, according to their, their um, literature, they are, quote, dedicated to helping one another shine. And my experience working with them a little bit is that's really true. Um, this organization started out in Boston and now has spokes uh, across the country. And many of us are, we have three speakers this afternoon, and many of us are familiar with Erica Heilman's work from listening to Vermont Public. Um, her podcast, Rumble Strip, uh, explores life in Vermont through conversations with ordinary people like us, um, dairy farmers, game wardens, and uh, it's the first independently produced podcast to win a Peabody Award and has received uh, amazing reviews from both the New York Times and the New Yorker magazine. And we also have Tamar Avishai. <laughs> she is an art historian who created the Lonely Palette as a way to return art history to the masses. Standing in front of a work of art with a microphone in hand, she invites museum visitors to describe it to her and to us. And these um, vivid descriptions are followed by, I have to say, eloquent explanations of the art and the history of the artist and the time it was created. And then um, Wade Roche is a technology journalist who shows soonish, soonish, sorry, it's hard to say, explores the places where future crosses into the present. And by talking with inventors, innovators, and scientists, he helps listeners understand how technological advances shape our lives and how we in turn are shaped by them, by the way we use them. Each presenter will share excerpts from their work and talk about the podcast as a medium of expression that's fairly new to most of us. And the thing that's great for me about podcasts is I've sort of lost track of those driveway moments because you can always finish the piece sometime else, um, which in the winter is a nice thing to lose. So uh, after their presentation, there will be time for questions and answer. And um, welcome, everyone. Hi. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I was told to remind everybody as the first person up here that we are having reception afterwards um, in the back of North Chapel. North Chapel. Um, so please come and join us. We've got really good sandwiches and we'll also just be able to continue the conversation. So, so my show is The Lonely Palette and I usually start every episode with um, an audio kind of patchwork of people that I've spoken to in front of a painting that is the painting of the episode or the artwork of the episode. And I ask them to just describe what they see because you can imagine a podcast about art is a little, you know, hard to sell. <laughs> um, but the descriptions that people give are really incredible. So I wanted to actually give you all the chance to be that patchwork at the beginning and just describe what you see. What do you see? No art historical interpretation necessary or required or even wanted. What do you see? An ocean. An ocean. Go from there. Probably Mount Fiji in the background or a volcanic mountain anyway. Okay, mountain in the background, which actually a lot of people don't see at first glance. What else? Before I saw the characters, I immediately recognized it as something ancient. Mm -hmm. Okay. Chinese? Is it Chinese? 
um, we'll, we'll get into it. This is just what you see. Imagine you're on the radio right now. Boats. Boats. Boats, ocean, wave, Asian. Tall blue waves with white foam. Okay, tall blue waves, white foam. When I was a child, we saw that the wave has fingers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, what does that remind you of? Any kind of associations? There is no wrong answer here. Much, I'm not one of those art historians. <laughs> Snow. The right. waves look like they're grabbing or they could be thrown back. Yeah. But they definitely are have movement. Okay. All right, one more. It is a little scary when you see the people on the boat and how mm -hmm. they're connected to it. Okay. Wonderful. So, this is The Lonely Palette, the podcast that returns art history to the masses, one object at a time. Wrong direction. Failure to start audio. Just a second. Let's try that again. So this is the sound that my six-month-old falls asleep to every night. It's from a sound machine that's designed to look like a jar full of fireflies. And it has a lot of soothing options, but I've never actually used any other sound than this. The others are too distracting. A good sound machine, I think, should carry you away. And I find that these ocean waves carry me. Simultaneously so dramatic and gentle, the endless cycle of crest and resolve. I turn it on and I sit nursing in the dim haze of a nightlight. I close my eyes and I let the sound take me back to a vacation I went on with my dad and my stepmom back in 2005 to a house that they rented on the outer banks of North Carolina. It was the first time I'd ever slept near the ocean. And I was amazed each night by how intensely the pounding of the surf just filled the space. I remember one night after they'd gone to bed, taking my journal outside to write about a heartbreak that I was in the midst of, and then finally setting down my pen in frustration because it took too much effort to hear my own thoughts over the sound of the waves. They were just such noisy, insistent reminders of how vast and indifferent the ocean was too big to think about and too loud to think about anything else. So I gave myself over to them. I let them just white out my thoughts. I stood at the railing overlooking the beach, my head full of sound, watching the tide coming in, the tide pulling out, the moon overhead and reflected in the water, feeling that meditative succession of infinite agitation and release, crest and resolve. And I thought about the deck at the side of the ocean the night my son was born, the relentless waves of contractions, that moment of peak, that break, that relief. And it's what I imagine happening in his little mind as he drifts off to sleep, maybe subconsciously reminded of the safety of that washing machine churn of life in utero, baby's first meditation, the gentle cycle, that royal, that quiet, his thoughts wiped away and carried off by the sound of the waves. You've seen The Great Wave off Kanagawa, an Edo period ukiyo-e print by the master of the craft, Katsushika Hokusai, a million times in a million different places. This iconic, instantly recognizable silhouette is plastered all over mugs and memes and mouse pads, and it even has its own emoji. And this is how people have experienced this print for as long as it's been around. It's always been a print, one of many, and widely available to the masses. But the trade-off of being seen and re-seen over and over 
is that you stop seeing it for what it really is. We don't see the great wave anymore for what it really is. An enormously powerful image of an enormously powerful thing. And if we stop for a moment and really look, there is so much happening in this print. There are compositional elements that thrust you into the pure energy of the moment. There's Japan's relationship, both sacred and mundane, to everything that's depicted in this scene. Mount Fuji, the fishing industry, Buddhism, the sea itself. And not least of all, there's the seismic splash, maybe even a crashing of a wave, that these prints made in the European art scene when Japan opened its borders in the middle of the 19th century. So let's look at this print. Let's really rediscover this print with all of this in mind. Let's take a pickaxe to that retaining wall of the image's iconic familiarity and open a path for the history and visual energy of this great wave to come barreling through just as nature intended. Too big to think about and too loud to think about anything else. So let's start with a quick oceanographic history lesson. The ocean currents from the several bodies of water and diversity of climates in Japan has made for some of the most varied and productive fishing industry in the world, which has made the fishing industry culturally and economically invaluable to Japan. And it was actually this fishing industry that gave rise to the merchant class that created this series of prints, which became the art of the middle class during this period known as the Edo period from 1615 to 1868. The city of Edo, now present day Tokyo, gave its name to a unique period of peace and prosperity in Japan, but at the expense of a rigid and repressive bureaucratic shogunate or ruling government, which closed itself off from the West. The shogunate had originally divided Edo society into four distinct classes. Samurai officials at the top, then farmers, artisans, and then merchants at the bottom. But Edo's increasingly mercantile economy, which was boosted by its lucrative fishing industry, meant that the merchant wealth soon started to outpace samurai wealth. And all of a sudden, Japan had this thriving middle class who could read and write and for our purposes, fully immerse itself in the arts. Cities became thriving hotbeds of high and low culture, and nowhere was this more potent than in the capital city of Edo itself, which boasted the largest and most famous pleasure quarters. That is, centers of the best high and low culture money could buy. Quarters that were known informally as ukiyo-e, or the floating world. The origins for this name, the floating world, are rooted in the fact that Edo Japan was also deeply Buddhist. And if you know anything about Buddhism, you know that its fundamental conceit is the awareness of the transience of life. We're only here for a pretty short time in this world of ours. And before our existence and this world itself floats away. But instead of dwelling on our earthly impermanence like a bunch of depressed nihilists, the residents of Edo chose instead to eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow they died. This philosophy permeated the floating world quarters with a culture of excess, of geishas, and merriment, and popular entertainment, and begat the ukiyo-e print, the pictures of the floating world. These prints, which were woodblock illustrations that emphasized line, pure color, and distillation of form, illustrated the pleasure quarters, the geishas, and, as we'll soon see, iconic images of Japan itself. And I'll just say, if you're lucky enough to stand in front of one of these unframed prints today, you're instructed to actually hold your hand over your mouth um, you know, lest your, your very breath risk damaging it. But at the time, um, 
it was colloquially said that you could purchase one of these for the same help for the same price as a double helping of noodles, which I love. Um, they were mass produced, mass disseminated, hardly considered valuable, and hardly even considered art. That is, until Katsushuka Hokusai came along. So, Hokusai, who was born in 1760, was already hugely famous by the time The Great Wave was printed in 1830. And this print was one of a series titled 36 Views of Mount Fuji, an immensely popular series that tapped into Japan's closed off and therefore extra concentrated interest in themselves. Hokusai revolutionized the genre away from pictures of pure pleasure to images of everyday life and soon became the go-to illustrator of quote-unquote true Japan. That is, images of iconic, recognizable Japanese sites that domestic tourists, since there weren't any other kind, would buy as souvenirs. Mount Fuji is the tallest mountain in Japan, and though it's mostly blocked by skyscrapers today, it would have been visible throughout Edo. giving the mountain this aura of being simultaneously mundane and sublime, a sacred totem to the city. The series looks at the mountain from a variety of different perspectives and vantage points. And many, like this famous print of Red Fuji, would put the mountain far more front and center than the Great Wave does and they were actually much more popular at the time because of it. The Great Wave was actually one of the final prints of the series when Hakusai started to get a little creative <laughs> after 36 um, in his placement, focusing more on the metaphor of the mountain than its physical prominence. We therefore see in the Great Wave a combination of elements that would have been deeply familiar to its purchasers the rarely depicted social class of fishermen battling the wave, the raging sea itself, and poking up its little head in the background, the spiritual anchor of Mount Fuji, caught just at its moment of closest resemblance to the wave in the foreground, the white-capped foam mirroring the iconic mountain peak, the spitting spray of the water falling on it like snow. Yet despite the quintessentially Japanese subject matter in the Great Wave, part of what makes it so revolutionary and so visually powerful is actually the way that Hokusai synthesized traditional Japanese aesthetics with his interest in Western art, art that he saw because Dutch traders had snuck the plates practically in under their coats and were then passed between artists. And in his hands, we see how these Western elements of linear perspective and color actually serve to greatly enhance the existing Japanese style. The low horizon line and slightly recessed background, both conventions of Western art, bring us directly into the action, as though we're looking from an equally doomed nearby fishing boat. At the same time, like in traditional Japanese prints, the foreground and background are still relatively unmediated, still flattened and compressed, which pushes all of the energy of the moment forward right into our faces. And this combination of graphic, stylized Japanese form and urgent Western realism creates a scene that is both static and full of moving parts. It draws our attention to the immediacy of the subject being depicted, which extends far beyond the view of Mount Fuji. We have this ruthless, terrifying power of the wave, our human surrender to the magnitude of nature. This wave descends like an attacking bear, its foam like claws, as you all see. Like a hundred individual hands are threatening to drag under each of these fishermen from their boats, who themselves are nothing more than faceless peas in a sugar snap pod, hopelessly outmatched.
But another element that makes this cross-cultural aesthetic exchange so interesting is that it traversed right back in the other direction where Western conventions were so effective in Japanese art, Japanese conventions played a powerfully influential role in Western art too, once Japan had fully opened to the West in 1868. And Europe as a whole, and the French Impressionists in particular, got a hold of these prints and lost their minds collectively. And to give you a sense of what I'm talking about, um, this is the great wave, not necessarily considered a direct inspiration for Debussy's cascading and moody La Mer, but it did show up on the score's cover in 1905. And you also have this incredible photo of Debussy and Stravinsky with a print of the great wave uh, framed in the background. So this more or less speaks for itself. And so began the era of Japan in Paris, when French artists went so gaga over these prints that some of the largest collections of them in the world were ultimately owned by Impressionist and post-Impressionist artists. And the first biography of Hokusai was actually published in France. And I should say at the outset that this Impressionist affinity for Japanese aesthetics, what's been labeled Japonisme, and we'll talk about that, this uh, collective, sorry, this impressionist affinity for Japanese aesthetics and what's been labeled as Japonisme, this kind of French co like collective craze for all things Japanese are two different things. Um, but they're also kind of intertwined, dependent on where you draw the distinction between authentic and inauthentic. And we're gonna dive into this, so we'll make a little bit more sense. In terms of the Japanese effect on Impressionist art, one of the first Japanese art objects to come to Paris was a sketchbook by Hokusai, which was passed around as hungrily by French artists as the Western plates had been passed around by Japanese artists half a century earlier. And they immediately began incorporating elements of Hokusai's style into their work. And you can understand why Japanese art represented such lightning in a bottle for these avant-garde impressionists who were looking for an alternative to the strict academic realism, especially one that embraced this sense of immediacy. And their work therefore started taking on these elements of pictorial flatness, diagonals, asymmetry, bold shadowless colors, and the kind of creative use of negative space that allows an image to appear finished, even if a background is technically empty. So if you take, for example, on the left, Degas' The Star from 1878, and on the right, uh, Mary Cassatt's Maternal Caress from 1890, you have the star, this star who is planted off-center in a similarly compressed energetic composition on a diagonally cut canvas, very Japanese. And then with Maternal Caress, it is so intentionally flattened and illustrated with such muted monochromatic colors that you'd almost be forgiven for mistaking this kind of crisp graphic image for an actual ukiyo-e print. I know I always did growing up. We used to have this in our bathroom. Of course, Japanese culture in Western art could also speak to this phenomenon of Japonisme, which I just mentioned, that French craze for Japanese culture, which however well-intentioned, um, is really more akin to kind of traditional definitions of post-colonial cultural appropriation than I think we're entirely comfortable admitting even to ourselves. In 1867, the International Exposition in Paris mounted the first show of Japanese prints in Europe opening the door for Japanese art, ceramics, kimonos, and fans to flood into Paris. And this is where we see a slightly less than authentic embrace of Japanese culture. Artists who were exploring a fad and attempted to capture an aesthetic that they don't entirely understand. Oh, come on. 
So a famous example of this is Monet's Le Japonaise at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, where he paints his wife Camille in a kimono and a blonde wig, um, holding, the fans, uh, holding a fan with the colors of the tricolor, clearly identifying a Japonisme phenomenon with his tongue firmly planted in his cheek, and at the same time trying to capitalize on it, and at the same time kind of trying his own hand at it. And while it is a rich, gorgeously painted kimono, you can't help but be a little put off by his front and center placement of a blonde Caucasian woman who is literally clothed in a samurai warrior um, and kind of coquettishly slipping this culture on. And then we have Van Gogh. He proclaimed earnestly, although a little superficially, that, quote, all his art was influenced by Japan. And it's in this homage to a print by a Japanese artist on the left that we get the sense of Van Gogh's kind of love letter passion for the Japanese aesthetic and his limitations of understanding this kind of cafeteria plucking of elements. So it's his copy of this print on the right. This print can only be described as pseudo-Japanese, overly flattened, accentuating this exoticized primitive, and most cringily, framed with Japanese characters that are completely made up. <laughs> An attempt to capture something that is clearly so meaningful to Van Gogh, but amounting to gobbledygook to any actual authentic custodian of this culture. But I should add, and I want to leave you with this for this particular segment, it's worth noting that when both Monet and Van Gogh painted work that was a little less attempting to kind of be on the Japanese nose and more about what Japanese artists were themselves influenced by, paintings like on the left Monet's Japanese Footbridge from 1899 and on the right Van Gogh's Almond Blossoms from 1890, this is where it feels like they kind of get it. They're starting to get it. But look, the ethics of this kind of cross-cultural intention versus impact exchange are not gonna be resolved here today. A more productive takeaway, I think, is to acknowledge what these prints meant to the Western artists who were cribbing from them. Because they are really really powerful. And the source of their power, I think, comes from the very fact that an ocean wave is both a powerful object in itself and an extraordinarily powerful metaphor. In this print, we see this wave right at its moment of climax, that unbearable peak of the contraction with the full knowledge that in the next moment of the narrative, it will break, swallowing these fishermen whole and not even bat an eyelash. But there's also the resolve, the fact of the wave as a relentless, unending reminder of impermanence, so impossibly big that it clears your mind of conscious thought, and maybe even reassuring in its infinite churn. And no one, would have appreciated this better than the very Buddhists who would have foregone their double helping of noodles to purchase this print in real time. Because to be a resident of the floating world of Edo was to understand the larger implications of an ocean wave as a metaphor for the cycle of life, not just an opportunity for indulgence in pleasure quarters, but a philosophy that you give your, yourself over to, and one that's impossible to grip with your mortal hands. And they would have embraced the words of the 20th century philosopher, V.F. Gunaratna, who wrote in his book, Buddhist Reflections on Death, quote, if you stand by the sea and watch how wave upon wave rises and falls, one wave merging into the next, that wave becoming another, you will appreciate that this entire world is also just that, becoming and becoming, end quote. 
And they surely would have appreciated Chidi, explaining the Buddhist philosophy of death to Eleanor in the beautifully gutting finale of the TV show, The Good Place, which I hope you've seen, where they come to realize the sad, exquisite beauty of making the choice to no longer exist. The dear wave in the ocean. You, know, you can see it measured in size, the way that some light refracts when it passes through, and it's there, and you can see it, you know what it is, it's a wave. And then it crashes in the shore. And it's gone. But the water is still there. The wave is just a, a different way for the water to be for a little while. And this one conception of death for a Buddhist. The wave returns to the ocean. where it came from, and where it's supposed to be. Not bad, Buddhist. Not bad. None of this is bad. And so this is what I find myself thinking about when I sit with my son before I lay him down in his crib, listening to the ocean. And I hope he's thinking about it too, in his own little way as he falls asleep. This quiet, meditative moment of release, away from the memes and the mouse pads, and giving ourselves over to these great waves. The tide rushing in, the tide pulling out, too big to process, and too loud to ignore, and gently, powerfully carrying us away. Wade Rausch of Soonish. Hi, everybody. Okay. One moment for a tech transition here. So Tamara's piece was about something cosmic in the sense that uh, it was about the vastness of the ocean. And I'm about to do part of an episode that is about time, which is all around us in the same way as the oceans in some ways. Yeah, if you could get rid of the little notifications. <laughs> And do you have a clicker tomorrow? Oh, here it is. Okay. Thanks for bearing with us. So I make a podcast called Soonish. And um, as Liza explained, it's about the future. 
and it's about how we shape technology and how technology shapes us. And I don't think that people realize it, but time is not real. It's a technology. <laughs> like, we don't, well, there's something physical to it, but we don't really know what it is. Um, physicists are nowhere close to understanding what time really is. So as we move through our days, we, we surround ourselves by time. It's on our watches, it's on our clocks, uh, it's at our bedsides, you know, it's on our phones. But um, it's a complete fiction. It's a complete construction. And this episode tries to get under the hood a little bit and talk about one specific way in which uh, we structure time. Uh, and it's about um, time zones. So this episode is called, This is How You Win the Time War. And I'm going to play the first half of it. I'm going to perform the first half of it. And if you want to listen to the whole thing, you can go to soonishpodcast.org and look for This is How You Win the Time War. And uh, this episode is about how, um, how New England is actually in the wrong time zone. <laughs> so we think we are in Eastern time. We really should be in Atlantic time, and I'm going to explain why. Okay, and uh, forgive me in advance for any technical problems. This is the first time I've performed this live before a, a real audience. So here goes. Hang on, just give me one second. My, my hard drive got disconnected while I was walking up here, and that's why I'm having to start from scratch. Okay, I'm going to hope it works now. Hub and Stokes. Audio collective. Listening to Soonish. I'm Wade Rash. I want to tell you a story about time and how we lose it and how we gain it. That's a topic I guarantee will be on your mind come this November. Right now, we're enjoying the glories of daylight saving time, but this fall, the annual switch back to standard time will come at 2 in the morning on Sunday, November 5th. Our clocks will fall back by an hour, which technically means we get an extra hour to sleep on Sunday morning. But come Sunday afternoon, we'll pay for that extra hour when the sun goes down an hour earlier. There is no more bitter reminder that winter is coming. And on top of that, this whole crazy ritual of switching our clocks twice a year has huge health costs, especially in the spring, when the hour we lose at the beginning of daylight saving time throws off our collective biological clocks, enough to cause a spike in heart attacks and even suicides. But my story doesn't start with winter or spring. It starts with summer. I grew up in central Michigan in the 70s and 80s. And every summer, I'd spend a few weeks visiting my parents, my grandparents' cottage on a lake in western Michigan. And I remember how, in the summer, my brother and I would be able to stay out swimming in the lake and goofing around in the yard until incredibly late in the evening. From late June into early July, the sun wouldn't go down until 9.30 p.m., and the twilight would last until well past 10. I loved those summer evenings. And I had never lived or vacationed anywhere else, so I thought they were normal. 
but they definitely weren't. I found that out the hard way. When I turned 18 and went off to college in the Boston area, where I still live today, what I noticed that first semester of college was that the sun goes down in Boston about an hour earlier than it does in Michigan, which was annoying enough because who likes to get out of class or out of work and realize it's already dark outside? But things got even worse in late October, which is when the nation used to switch from daylight saving time back to standard time. So on October 26, 1985, the sun went down at 5.45 p.m. And on Sunday, October 27th, it went down at 4.45 p.m. And it is hard to explain how much that bummed me out. I mean, I was a college freshman, so it wasn't like I was getting up that early anyway. And then the sun would suddenly go down. I was living most of my life in the dark. And that darkness kept eating into the day because as November and December progressed, the sun would go down earlier and earlier every day until the winter solstice when the sun would set at an absurdly early 4.15 p.m. I felt like I'd been kidnapped by aliens and forced to live on a planet where the days had been chopped in half. So what was really going on here? Why did 18-year-old me feel like it was ridiculous that the sun goes down so early in Boston in the winter? I'm going to give away the answer right now because I still feel like it's ridiculous and I want people to know that we could end this insanity. And the reason I felt so out of place here in New England is that I grew up in a different region that had long ago decided to give itself more daylight. And if such a thing is possible, if you can just vote to give yourself more daylight, then we could do that here in New England too. We could start to see clock time for what it really is an artificial construct that we humans designed and we can also change. That's the message of today's episode. I'll start with a little more Michigan history, but first we've got to zoom out and talk about the big stuff. So why is it that clock time here in New England is the same as it is in Detroit or Lansing or Grand Rapids, Michigan? Well, it's because Michigan and the New England states are all in the Eastern Standard Time Zone of North America. Time zones have been a thing ever since the 1880s, when the railroad companies got tired of the old patchwork system where every city observed its own local time based on solar noon, the moment when the sun reaches its highest point in the sky. Solar time had kind of worked in the era of horses and stagecoaches, when nobody ever moved faster than about 20 miles per hour, and you couldn't travel far enough east or west in one day for the difference in solar noons to make any real difference, to be a father. But in the steam age, locomotives could cover hundreds of miles in a day, and it just didn't make any sense for long-distance passengers to have to adjust their pocket watches every time they pulled into a new station. On top of that, the crazy quilt of, of local solar times was an obvious safety nightmare for railroad engineers. Because how could you know that the tracks ahead of you would be clear if you weren't even operating on the same time as all the other trains on the track? So, in October of 1883, a bunch of railroad executives met in Chicago and decided to carve up the continental United States into four time zones, each separated by exactly one hour. They imagined that the rest of the globe would follow suit and create another 20 time zones circling the entire globe, which is exactly what happened about a year later at a meeting in Washington, D.C. called the International Meridian Conference. That's the same conference where everyone agreed once and for all that the prime meridian, zero degrees of longitude, would be the line that runs through Greenwich Observatory outside London. Now, when you divide 360 degrees of longitude into 24 slices, one for each hour, then in theory, each time zone winds up being 15 degrees wide. The eastern time zone in the United States is five time zones west of the prime meridian in Greenwich, which means eastern time is centered on 75 degrees west longitude. That's a line that runs roughly through Philadelphia. So in theory, Eastern time should mean the slice of the surface that goes all the way from 67 and a half degrees west to 82 and a half degrees west. But wait, almost the entire state of Michigan lies west of 82.5 degrees longitude, which means that by all rights, the state should be in central time. 
And in fact, when the railroads drew the boundaries between time zones in 1883, Michigan was in central time, and it stayed there until 1915. Now here's the remarkable part of the story. Michigan might still be on central time today if it weren't for a man who lived in Detroit named Dr. George Raynaud. Dr. Raynaud was the founder of the Moore Daylight Club, which, you know, at its outset in 1907, had exactly two members. So what was the purpose of the Moore Daylight Club? It was right there in the name. Dr. Raynaud didn't like it when the sun went down before 5 o'clock in the winter and before 9 o'clock in the summer. He figured that if Detroit could just observe Eastern Standard Time, like its sister city of Windsor, Ontario, across the river, everybody would get to enjoy more daylight in the evening. Keep in mind, this was before the mention of daylight saving time, which is a whole different kettle of fish. Renaud called it fast time. And here's how he described it later in an article in the American Review of Reviews. The agitation for Eastern Standard Time was an effort to recover several hundred hours yearly of daylight that were lost in the early morning hours before arriving and utilizing them at the end of the day for purposes of recreation, outdoor living, health, etc. The scheme is based upon the fact that our habits are regulated largely by the clock. Under Central Standard Time, during nine or ten months of the year, the sun was shining from one to several hours each morning while we were asleep, while darkness rapidly approached soon after the end of the day's work. Of the advantages of recovering much of this waste of daylight, there can be no argument. As for the method of doing so, the adoption of a fast time offers the only logical, feasible, and practical method for a community. At first, everybody thought the Moore Daylight Club's idea was pretty dim-witted. When Renaud organized a citywide ballot initiative in 1908, all 150 precincts voted it down. But the club gradually found more supporters, including downtown retailers, who had visions of consumers strolling and shopping for an extra hour every night. By 1915, Renaud was able to convince a majority of the Detroit City Council to defect from Central Time and join Eastern Time. Later, other Michigan cities like Lansing and Grand Rapids followed Detroit's lead. And in 1931, the state legislature moved the whole state into Eastern Time. Except for a few counties in the Upper Peninsula that really should be part of Wisconsin anyway, if you ask me. So, to bring all of this home, the reason I grew up thinking that the gloriously late sunsets were normal was that I was born in a state that had, had been on the eastern edge of the central time zone, but then decided to be on the western edge of the eastern time zone. And I didn't know it then, but I had Dr. Raynaud and the Moore Daylight Club to thank for it. I also didn't know it then, but when I moved from Michigan to Massachusetts, it was like giving away that gift from Dr. Raynaud. So now I live in a place that's close to the eastern edge of the eastern time zone, which means that Bostonians give up a huge amount of daylight. If you live in Philadelphia at the center of the eastern time zone, you get an extra 20 minutes of daylight compared to Boston. If Michigan could transplant itself from central time into eastern time back in the 19 teens, couldn't New England defect from eastern time today and join the next time zone over? Well, the answer is yes, it absolutely could. <laughs> In fact, there's a bill pending in the Massachusetts legislature right now that would do exactly that, in coordination with similar legislation in Maine, New Hampshire, and Rhode Island. It would put most of New England into Atlantic Standard Time, where we would join the maritime provinces of Canada. And now I want you to meet the man behind that bill. I think of him as the Dr. George Raynaud of our time. So, my name is Tom Emsweiler. I live in Quincy, Massachusetts, where I've lived for the last 10 years. I'm originally from um, Virginia. Specifically, Tom grew up in the DC suburbs of Northern Virginia. He went to James Madison University in the Shenandoah Valley, and after college, he worked for a while as a legislative aide to a member of Congress. And then he got a graduate degree in health administration. Uh, and then I moved up to the Boston area in 2011. Uh, to do healthcare stuff. I knew that I was moving north, but I had no idea how far I was moving east. So you can imagine my horror, my first December in New England, and I had the sun setting at 4.11 p.m., yeah, which I consider the daytime, not the nighttime. And I thought to myself, there has to be a better way. 
As a legislative aide, M. Emsweiler had learned the art of writing, writing op-eds, mostly about health care. But one summer night in 2014, after he had put his kids to bed, he sat down at the computer and he wrote a very different kind of op-ed piece. Anyways, this thing poured out of me, this <laughs> idea that, gosh, maybe we're in the wrong time zone altogether because we're hanging out in the ocean. Meanwhile, you have like, you know, Ohio and Michigan and Pennsylvania kind of in the middle of the Eastern time zone. So I thought to myself, what if we really should be in the Atlantic time zone? Emsweiler submitted his argument to the Boston Globe, and he was pretty sure they would say, no thanks, that's a dim-witted idea. But the paper actually published it, in the Sunday edition, no less. It was on page, you know, K5 or whatever. And then something funny happened, which is people actually read it, which was <laughs> uh, a fun surprise. It was like the top two or three read story up through like Wednesday of that week. It was, got lots of views, which was, which was awesome. Readers of the Globe got into flame wars over Emsweiler's idea in the paper's comment section. He got asked to do a TV interview with a local meteorologist on Boston's Channel 4. After that 15 minutes of fame, most people would just go back to their normal lives, but Emsweiler's op-ed had clearly struck a nerve, and he saw a chance to convert his idea into action. He happened to know that in Massachusetts, there's a thing called a bill by request, where any constituent can submit a bill for the consideration of their legislator. So he wrote up a bill describing this idea for transplanting Massachusetts into Atlantic Standard Time and calling for an official study of the idea. And lo and behold, two state senators, including the Senate president, liked the bill by request, and they picked it up and inserted it into an economic development bill. And so this is 2016, summer 2016, and it made it through. The governor has line item veto for like spending, but also for like non-spending. So it, the governor could have taken it out and I think chose to just leave it alone. And so my little bill that could became law only a year or so after I filed it. The new study commission had 11 people on it, including Ensweiler, and he says they spent most of 2017 holding public hearings and writing up their findings. And so on November 1st, 2017, we produced our report. And that report, endorsed by the committee on a vote of nine to one with one absent, we endorsed moving thoughtfully, as a region, to year-round length time. Now, this shift is not as radical as it might sound. After all, from mid-March to early November, when most of the U.S. is on daylight saving time, the East Coast is already in the same time as Atlantic Standard Time. So, it's the same time we have now, except instead of eight months a year, it would be 12 months a year. Um, and so then after that, I had to wait for the next legislative session to start. But in, I guess, January... 2019, we submitted a bill to actually make the move and said, um, if this bill passes, this means Massachusetts wants to make the move. And once we have Maine, New Hampshire, and Rhode Island together, the four of us will go to the U.S. Department of Transportation, who handles time zones, and say, we want to have this, we want to move time zones so we're at the same time year end. So in in 2019, I believe, a similar bill passed both houses of the Maine legislature, and it passed the New Hampshire House. And that, unfortunately, was where Emsweiler's luck ran out. It did have a hearing in Massachusetts, and by hearing, they do these smaller, less important bills en masse, and so there was a bunch of people lined up to testify about a bunch of different bills. And I was there, I think, by myself, and I read my little statement, they have a Death Star clock counting down for three minutes. So I had practiced, and so I read my script. There were no questions. My bill was not acted on. And, uh, you know, that's how a bill does not become a law. <laughs> Emsweiler and his supporters refiled the bill at the start of the following legislative session in January of 2021. And so I have not heard anything. I imagine they will have some sort of hearing this fall. Emsweiler isn't sure why the bill seems to be stalled right now in the State House. He says almost everybody he talks to seems to like the idea. The only group that's ever raised a serious objection to the plan is the radio and TV broadcasting industry. Their problem with it is that they have to work around the live network feeds out of New York, which means that for four months out of the year, when Atlantic Standard Time and Eastern Standard Time are actually an hour apart, the morning news shows and the late night talk shows would air an hour earlier and people might decide not to watch them. 
I think a lot of people base their sleep schedule on what they want to watch on television tonight. Now, I'll give you one guess. Who doesn't want people to go to bed an hour early and stop watching television? Can you tell me who you think it is? Gee, could it possibly be the National Association of Broadcasters? Right. They want eyeballs on their advertisements for 409 and Cheerios. So the battle of the TV schedules is one that Emsweiler hasn't figured out how to fight. But he is encouraged by the fact that Massachusetts Senator Ed Markey is part of a bipartisan group of senators who've introduced a related proposal called the Sunshine Protection Act. If that act became law, it would make daylight saving time permanent throughout the nation. We would stop switching our clocks back and forth, and it would sort of be like moving the entire country one time zone to the east. So in that sense, it would do the same thing as Emsweiler's proposal. Would you be equally happy with both of those alternatives? Because they accomplish the same thing. It's just a different way of framing it, right? So do you think the framing matters? Um, I mean, it, it doesn't matter to me. I just want the outcome. I think when you're talking about a local move, you have to think about moving time zones. What has more momentum over the last two years or so is a national conversation to stay on daylight time year-round. And that would, be, that would be fine with me, too. That would amount to an admission that we misplaced all of the time zones. Basically, that we're agreeing as a country that we're going to shift the whole country one time zone to the east because the ones that the railroads created in the 1880s just don't work for us anymore. Right. I mean, ideally, yeah, that's the thing. It's because before the railroads, we we'll just would look up and say, is it noon yet? <laughs> right? Solar noon is different at every point on the globe, right? So you could either have one time zone like China, but that I don't think it's popular. So then you can have time zones. And if you're going to have time zones, what makes the most sense for how we live now? You know, and most people, for better or for worse, summertime fits more with their work, sleep, entertainment, family schedules. Okay. Um, I'd like to do a little game show here, if you don't mind. I went through all of the comments that people left on your Globe article, and there are 164 of them. And I tried to boil them down into categories and kind of combine comments together that were similar to each other. So I have a list of sort of summary objections to your idea. And I wondered if it might be fun to kind of run through them and ask you to respond quickly, sort of in a lightning round style. You don't need to spend an hour on this, but I'd love to hear your quick answers to sure. these. Okay. So the first one and really the most common one was, if the sunrise was later, Kids will be going to school in the dark in the middle of the winter. What's your reaction to that? Uh, as someone with two small children, nothing is more important to me than the safety of our kids. Uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics came out with a study uh, a few years ago called Let Them Sleep, saying that no school should start before 8.30. 8.30 is well after a late Atlantic time sunrise, which would be about 8.14. Okay, that's a good answer. Some people just genuinely seem to prefer sunshine in the morning to sunshine in the evening. Yep, it's, it's personal preference. Some people like to jog. Some people like to take walks after dinner. Uh, I guess there's two different types of folks. Um, totally personal preference. Um, I'd rather not lose the first 45 minutes of daylight while I'm sleeping, as opposed to being breaking leaves in the dark at 4.55. A couple people said that the surrounding states would never go along, that it would be too hard to get New Hampshire and Maine and Rhode Island and Massachusetts to act together on anything, and therefore the idea is a non-starter. All those states are waiting for us. Okay, cool. Uh, a more cynical person said politicians in general will never be able to get their act together since they're, they live on a different planet and they can't do anything useful. That's a somewhat jaded response, I guess, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that's an argument for a... Um, a ballot initiative, right? Where we check the box, yes or no? Yeah, I think that would be great. I think if we had a ballot initiative, it would pass, and it'd be a done, a done deal, at least the Massachusetts part. I think it's right that the legislature is very cautious, and it's gonna need to be overwhelming to get them to move. There was another group of commenters who felt that if you're gonna mess with time, the only acceptable change would be to abolish summertime and, and go back to standard time year round so that we could, quote, experience time as our, for our forefathers did. Sure. Again, right now in summer, the sun rises at 5 o'clock. On standard time, the sun will rise at 4 a.m., which means it will get light at 3.30 a.m. I think that is too early. 
people are binging Netflix <laughs> past, you know, uh, you know, eight o'clock. So no one wants to get up at three thirty. Almost, almost no one. Okay, and finally, this whole question about time zones is really unimportant, and people who think about it aren't being very serious and should just find something more important to worry about, and or just get it over with and move to their time zone of choice. It's so important to them. Let's do it. But <laughs> <laughs> you want all of us to move to our time zone of choice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you're not moving to Newfoundland, right? Right. Uh, I'm very popular with the Canadian Maritime Press, by the way. I've done several interviews with their radio stations. I wanted to end with a couple of more kind of personal questions, I guess, or philosophical questions. So, so one is like, how do you imagine it would affect you and your family if this goal were accomplished? If we did switch to Atlantic time or year-round daylight time, how would your life be better? Well, how, how would it be different? It'd be very minimal. <laughs> it, it's, it'd be like walking into a room and saying to yourself, "What? Th this temperature in this room is great." You know, <laughs> you don't notice that. You know, you only notice if it's if it's too hot or too cold. If it's the right temperature, you don't you don't remark it to yourself, right? So I think instead of looking up at the December sky and saying, "Oh, I can't believe it's three thirty and I, I can't even see the sun that's behind the trees already," you know, we would end our day and and not really notice anything. We'd notice very gradual change in the sun setting earlier, but we wouldn't it wouldn't be so stark and dark. I do think it'd be a minimal change. I think it would be better if we didn't have spring forward when everyone gets jet lag. I think we get we wouldn't lose any sleep in the spring and we wouldn't have the stark change in the fall. But I do think it'd be something that we, we wouldn't really notice too much. You've been working on this and thinking about this and writing about this for, like you said, almost a decade. Have you developed kind of a philosophy about the human relationship to time? And maybe I should give you some context. I mean, my own point of view from having thought about this, you know, I was... I wrote a research paper when I was an undergrad about the invention of standard time. And uh, you know, so I had to kind of dig out the whole history of the railroads and why it was important to them to get on a coordinated time system. And it was really important because you couldn't have trains running on the same tracks at the same time. You needed to know what time it was, right? But, you know, that was 150 years ago. And I feel like clock time is supposed to be a convenience. It's supposed to be a tool. It's not supposed to be a straitjacket. And it shouldn't be a big surprise if the system we created in the 1880s, you know, doesn't serve us well anymore. And we should be ready and willing and able to alter it to suit modern needs if that's the right thing to do. Since time is fundamentally arbitrary to begin with. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting thought. I do think having some guideposts is, is good. But we shouldn't, let, we shouldn't let time boss us around. You know what I mean? We should, we should be in charge of it, not or television shows, or anything else. It, it's, it's never a bad idea to take a step back and think to yourself, is this, is this how I want to live my life? And especially as you have life changes, you know, if you have small children, you might want to do one thing. If you're an empty nester, uh, you might want to do something else. Or if you don't have children, you might want to do something different. So it's always a good idea to step back and reflect. Okay, that's part one of that episode. Part two is about the idea of abolishing time zones completely and having exactly one global time. And um, so I, if you're curious about that idea, go and listen to the entire show. Thanks for listening. Uh, Erica Heilman is up next. She's gonna do a live version of Rumble Strip. Live-ish. Live-ish. Yeah. And um, I want to just uh, repeat what Tamar said. Everybody is welcome um, at the reception afterwards at North Chapel, and um, you can park around back and come right in the uh, ground floor, and, and we hope to see you all there uh, after the performances and after the panel. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming, everybody. I'm going to play two short, short pieces that I love this time of year that remind me of this time of year in Vermont that we wait for. Is this something you need? Nope. Oh, okay. Yes, I do need it. Okay. I'm going to operate this. Yes. Okay.
Um, many of you may have heard these because they aired on Vermont Public. But oh, sorry. Yes, here we go. Hello, is it working? Yeah, yep. you have to be really close to it. Okay. Yeah. Super okay. close, like almost eating. Like it. I'm eating it. Yeah. It sounds still sounds really dim. Is it? Is it possible to turn it up a little bit? No, it's already at maximum. Okay. I'm going to turn okay. down your sound. I'm not going to be talking very much, as it turns out, so this will work fine. Okay. Um, so the first story is, uh, is a short story, uh, and it's called Makeup for Special Occasion. Um, and here it is. <coughs> Oh, I'm not plugged into the audio. This is my first attempt at a live show, everybody. Okay, here we go. I'm looking for someone who can do it. It's not working. Oh, here we go. I'm looking for someone who'd be willing to do my makeup and possibly hair on the 23rd of this month. So something simple with my eyes and something to hide some red spots. Is there any way to make an illusion of a skinnier face? I usually don't like anything that's considered girly, however, I want to surprise my boyfriend for our first ever anniversary. I have a nice dress picked out with some matching press-on nails. The issue is I have no clue how to do makeup, considering I don't own any makeup and I have a very round, chubby face. Thank you for reading. That's Tiana reading a posting she wrote for Front Porch Forum in Hardwick. You all know Front Porch Forum. Uh, we all have one in every town. Uh, my front, front, front Porch Forum is in Callis, and there are lots of bear sightings. Um, people buy and sell a lot of tires. Uh, last week, we learned that someone left a red thermos and a striped towel at Number 10 Pond, and someone else scored a champion three-inch portable chipper. People complain about the select board a lot on my front, front porch forum. And after the winter storm, after winter storms, you, you know, somebody will go on and talk about how great the road crew is doing. And then we'll tell all of us that we should all be more appreciative of the road crew. Um, there are a lot of lost and found cats. Anyway, my friend Tara found this posting from Tiana on Front Porch Forum in Hardwick, and we agreed that it was the most vulnerable, most open-hearted. It was just a beautiful posting, and we decided we needed to contact her, and we needed to make sure that she got her makeup and hair done. Um, but we don't know how to do it, so we found a professional to do it for her. Um, and I met her the day before her big date, and uh, we, we talked for a little bit, and this is Tiana. My boyfriend's never seen me dress up, ever. In the two years he has known me, I'm usually wearing work clothes. He's never seen me wear a dress, and I've joked around with him, like, oh yeah, I used to wear a dress here and there for special occasions. He's like, yeah, I can't picture you in that. So I was like, I could just surprise him. I could just kind of walk up to him and be like, hey, let's go. And I'm, I'm wearing a beautiful dress that I have uh, my friend that gave me. I have a pair of high heels. I'll be his height because he's like almost a foot taller than me. And I, I picked out some fake nails, although I hate nails. So they'll probably just stay on until I get to the restaurant. <laughs> and then he'll know what I would look like with them. And maybe I could just, I don't, I know that I don't have to impress him because he already loves me, but... I thought it would be nice to just try to look pretty for him. When do you feel pretty? Uh, I guess I feel pretty when I have my hair down. Um, I got a nice smile. If I'm like standing in front of a sunset and you can kind of see like a, I have blue eyes and they're just reflecting off the water and yeah, I like that. So what do you have in mind for, for makeup and hair? Ah, uh, I am not an expertise when it comes to any of that, but I know he likes, um, when I, when I get out of the shower and my hair is still wet, 
it naturally curls. And he says he really likes when it looks like that. So I'm thinking maybe I could uh, attempt to have my hair curled and then any kind of makeup look that would match uh, the dress. It's got these brown buttons in the front just as decoration and the brown buttons would match my brown uh, high heels. So the brown shoes match the buttons and then I kind of got nails that go with like the brown effect by having them be gold and then everything else is kind of black. Does he know where you're going tomorrow night? Yeah, I gave him the option on if he wanted to go to Applebee's, Texas Roadhouse, or the 99 because I have $100 set aside for just food. I'm willing to splurge. Um, I asked for the day off, but I didn't receive it off, and I'm not going to complain because it's only a four-hour shift, so I can make that work. Um, directly after it, thanks to you, I'm able to get ready and kind of prep myself. That's the biggest surprise for my boyfriend. When I get back, I don't know if I, I don't really have it up all planned out present wise, but I did get him some gifts. He very much so needed some new underclothing, which I bought him. Um, one is actually like a, all decked out and just has prints on it that I think he'll like. And then the other are just from Dollar General that you know, he can wear. And he is in dire need of some new shoes. So when we go to the restaurant, which I have picked out as the 99 in Littleton, and I know that's directly by Walmart, so I'm gonna either before or after go to Walmart, have him pick out his own shoes, and you know, we'll just kind of enjoy some food. I've been craving a really juicy steak, so I don't know what he wants, but I'm getting steak. <laughs> He's not a flirt type, but it would be nice if he just kind of, you know, like in movies. I know this is corny as heck, but I think it would be cute if he's just like, wow, you look pretty or you look beautiful or just comment something and then kiss me. I don't think he'll say what I want him to say, but even if he doesn't say it, you know, his face will. What is your fantasy about what you want your life to look like? I mean, if you could have whatever you wanted, what would you want? As of currently, um, I would want to remain in Vermont as my home because it's all I've ever known. I love Vermont. But I have a dream of, you know, having a steady relationship, uh, having a kid, and doing my absolute best to travel to all 50 states. Um, it's not a very realistic dream due to my current financial setting, but even if I don't see all 50, maybe I'll see 15 and that will still be a huge accomplishment. We live X amount of years, you know, we travel X amount of miles to and from work to home and we always see the same thing. Our whole life, a majority of people, they only ever see the same thing going all these miles. I don't want to do that. I don't want to just exist. I want to be out there. I want to do stuff. I want to live. Tiana and her boyfriend had a good time on their date. She says there was no wait at the restaurant and the food was delicious. On the way home from Littleton, they stopped at a beach and they looked at the stars. So um, this, this next story is called The Neighborhood, and um, I made it in Randolph a few years ago, and it, it's, it's all children who are terrifying to interview um, because they, 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 they really don't take any false note. I mean, they can smell you out. Mm -hmm. So they're really, they're, they're scary, hard to interview, but these, I love these kids. Um, it's called The Neighborhood. Secret shortcut if we're um, if we're going walking and we split up and we don't know where we are. I think we always um use walkie talkies if we split up. Next to Dunkin' Donuts, there's this trail that we know. This secret trail that we know. It's between me, my brother, and Elijah. 
You know it? That's Lincoln. He's six. He lives in the neighborhood right behind hospital, the hospital in Randolph. It's actually called Hospital Hill. The kids who live here describe it as a place with three purple houses, a shortcut through the woods down to Dunkin' Donuts, and pretty close to three graveyards, except that when they say the graveyard, they mean the big one at the end of the street. The kids in this neighborhood run in twos and threes, and sometimes in one big pack for a game of hide and seek, or if they're playing at night, they call it manhunt. I spent an afternoon talking with them and following them around and recording them in their natural environment. This show is a little taste of that day, a kind of postcard from childhood, a place that we remember but we can't go anymore. So there's a zombie who's the tiger. They count to something and everybody runs away. But they don't hide. The zombie chases them. And there's an antidote, which the people carry. And there's the zombie's poison, which the zombie can throw. And if it hits you at all, you become a zombie. So if someone gets tagged by the zombie, they have um, 10 seconds to be revived by the antidote. But they can only be revived twice. The third time, they automatically just become a zombie. Because the antidote just doesn't work anymore. Otherwise... Zombies never win. But if the zombie somehow gets hold of the antidote um, and they get it to the original zombie, the zombies win and it's like Excuse over. Me, you right when you play games like tag, like manhunt, when you play that, if you know where everybody is, you want to be quiet and sneak up on them. When you don't want to know where, when you don't know where they are, you want to act like you do and say things that make them think that you're close to them, like, um, I can see you, or stuff like that. There are people who are my friends, but only my friends, when they're not with other people that are just their friends. I'm friends with Elliot, but we're always friends. But if I'm friends, like, I was friends with Abby and Riley last Monday. I wouldn't say that I'm necessarily that great friends with them right now. But it's not usually like that. Um, it's usually like two days they're friends with me, the next two days they're not. Um, two days they're friends with me, at the end of the day he's running and then he, he yells, I'm not your friend anymore. But I don't really believe that because he always says that, and then the next day, he really wants my help. I don't usually give the help usually, only the next day. Okay, so we're going to be now. Oh, we're behind the rock. If they see me, I have to go right there, so I can do good. Tell me, tell me more about this spot. This is a good spot. It's a really good spot, and we have all places. Vivi and Mama just went. Because they want us to be tagged all together. We can't be tagged together because that's what they want. If they see someone, we have to go this way, stay here. There are several graveyards. There are three graveyards. But when we're like, hey, want to go play, play tag in the graveyard? We always know that it's the big graveyard over there. It's not like one of the other two. But I don't know why that is, but we always think of it as that one. Probably the farthest boundary that we go is probably well way down in the woods and like the well, whole woods area is, is like ours, the graveyard, the woods, everything in the woods is our territory and like we know everything around town but we that doesn't mean we don't always not go to the bad places. We go we go there, walk through um the places the really broken stuff and stuff. You need to know where um your places, good places are, your bad places are. Where are we so far? Uh, Lincoln's cheating. 
Count three or four. One yard away. And Lincoln still to you. Well, there's this one lady. I don't know. Everybody's just kind of scared oh, of her yeah. because she talks to herself. Yeah. It's, it's not like she isn't nice. She's really nice. She says hi to you and stuff. But she used to have this old dog who, that, that she would carry around in a baby cradle and she would talk to it and like kind of treat it as though her baby was just kind yeah. of creepy. But I felt really That's bad true. for her recently because yeah. the dog died. It was really old. So now she's kind of alone and yeah. Yeah. What's it going to be like when you grow up? Are you going to miss this time? It depends on what I do when I grow up. What do you think you're going to do? I'm probably going to be a horse farrier. Yeah, my two uncles are both um, horse farriers, and my grandpa's also a horse farrier, and he's pretty known for it because he's a really, really good horse farrier. For each horse, I used to think you'd get like $50, but apparently you could get like $250 for one horse, depending on what job you're doing. It's a really well-paying job. It would be hard, and it would make you sweat a lot, and it would take a lot of strength and skill, but it would be a very good job to have. Elliot thinks that he tackled the kitten. He thinks he thinks that that should be the case, um, because he tried to tag me. It was close. I tagged you four times. No, you didn't. <laughs> you sure about that? Yes. What about over there, and then over in the corner over there, and right there twice? Now let me guess. You're not out again. Usually, the big kids don't let me include, they don't include me from further big kid games. I'm less assured of them. They just include me a lot. I don't really like hide and seek, but I don't really like being a seeker because I'm really bad at that. I'm always really good at hiding. Because I'm small, so I can fix through um, small places, like I said. And they think everyone is as big as them, almost. Um, so they think I wouldn't fit through the small places, that, but I actually am. So I'm usually the last one to get found. So they can't be the um, boss of me always. Do you think you're going to grow out of the neighborhood? No. I mean, eventually you're going to grow up. Yeah. Probably still going to come back here eventually and just kind of see what it's kind of looks like in like 20 years or 30 years or something. I'm probably going to come back and see what it looks like and see how much it's changed. Thank you.